So thanks for coming, you guys. I know you guys want to beat traffic and get home to your families, and you're still here with me. I'm amazed by that. I had to be here with you guys. <laughs> so my name is Ike Ellis. I'm a SQL Server MVP. Um, I run a couple user groups. I speak. Uh, I won't stand here. Um, I speak a lot, and uh, I've got a book coming out. So a lot of stuff going on. Um, and I'm glad to be here with you today. If you want to connect with me, check uh, you know, Twitter's a good way, or just Ike at IkeEllis.com. I always answer questions. So I jotted this down real quick a couple nights ago, and I just did it from my memory. This right in front of you is the SQL Server stack. Like, if you want to be good at everything that SQL Server has to offer, and maybe a little bit more, you need to just know all this, right? Look at that. Can you guys even see that font? <laughs> but usually what this ends up being is kind of like a menu, right? Like if you're going to install SQL Server, you're going to look at this thing and you're going to say, yeah, I want Power Pivot and DAX and maybe BCP and SSIS, and then you're going to kind of ignore the rest, right? Or you're going to say, you know what, I'm a DBA who likes T-SQL, and I like Excel, and I like clustering and PowerShell, and then that's it, right? But until your boss comes and says, you're now doing reporting services, so now know that, right? This is what people call the long tail, where the product, everybody kind of uses the engine, but then we've got this long tail of features that people are selecting from. Okay. So, I, I share that with you because I want you to understand the purpose of this session. I know that you guys do a lot of different things with SQL Server, and probably no two people have the same job here. So what I've done is I've created um, a session that I just, you know, every tip or trick that I'm going to share with you is about three to five minutes long. And it hits some of these features that were up on that board. So if I hit a tip that doesn't really apply to you, just, you know, check Facebook or something and then check back in with me in three minutes, I'm going to change topics. <laughs> I call this like a presentation for the meme generation, right? Like we have such short attention spans, the minute, the minute YouTube has more than a two minute video, we click off it to go somewhere else, right? That's, a, that's the idea behind this session. So it's, think of it as like 20 separate talks that are unrelated to each other. And I have 20 tips. I actually have 35 tips, but my goal is to get through 20. We have an hour. Do you think we'll do it? I don't think so. I mean, you guys do look pretty smart, but I don't think I can talk that fast. <laughs> we'll see how many questions you guys have. So let's just go with tip number one, SSIS for the colorblind. So this is SQL Server Integration Services. And, you know, this is a typical package where we have a workflow going. And I had a team member that was colorblind in these, like, red and green. It's like a freaking nightmare for that guy. So what we learned is that in our tips, we could just say, show precedent constraint labels. And by checking that and clicking OK, we got these labels down here. Success, failure, completion, right? They're pretty easy, right? And um, the, another cool thing that we could do that we learned in SSIS is that underneath our properties of our constraint, we could make logical ors. So logical ands are solid lines. Logical ors are dashed lines, right? One of those two things has to complete for my clean up my junk stuff to complete, right? And that's just basic SSIS, but a lot of people don't know this, so I like to kind of share it with you. Tip number two, five minute, see, separate talk, right? Change topics, right? You guys with me? I'll, I'll wake you guys up when I change topics. Okay, so tip number two, five minutes of report formatting 10 times more impressive. Just a quick story, I'll try not to have too many tangents, but when I was writing line of business applications, we could have a Rembrandt of a line of business application and not sell anything. But we could have a Rembrandt for reporting and kind of a cruddy line of business application and sell it all day long. And we finally figured out that it's because the C-level guys don't care about the app. Right? The, the decision makers, they only care about the report. So a little bit of time in reporting goes an awful long way. So I've got a quick report. This is not a Rembrandt. This is just my ugly customer's report. And if I run this thing, I don't know if it shows up on, is that resolution okay? Is that kind of a typical report, headers, detail, a title, right? Okay. So what we can do 
Does anybody have a company logo they think sound, looks really cool? I know that's, I put you on the spot. Anybody proud of their company logo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody. Oh, what's your company? Co-op Financial Services. Can you go to the URL real quick? co-opfs.org. You love Co-op Financial Services, and you're proud of your logo. That's, so this thing, this is, okay. All right, so <laughs> we're going to go ahead and, and save the link. Okay, let's, um, let's, uh, so can I not get to your link for some reason in Chrome? I think it's Flash. It's what? I think it's in Flash. So it it's in Flash. Your logo is in Flash. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to go, instead of going to Co-op Financial Services, which I appreciate, but I can't. Okay. We're going to go to Morg File. Have you guys ever played with Morg File before? A lot of people, when they do image searching, they do GIS, right? But GIS, you get watermarks, copyrighted photos, stuff you can't use. Um, Morg File is all public domain. So like these berries are public domain. And um, anybody have like, like I, I've done piano before, because pianos I think are beautiful instruments, right? I can see a piano that I like, and like, let's see if there's one I particularly like. Um, why don't we look at this one? This piano is pretty nice. So what I'll do is I'll click on that piano, and I'll save it. So we'll just copy the image. Uh, let's save the image on my desktop, and we'll just call it piano. Okay, and then I've got this JPEG URL right here. Come on, let's just copy that. Copy link address, okay. Now let's go back to Chrome. And this is Lavish Bootstrap. Have you, ever, you guys ever played with Lavish Bootstrap before? So web developers love Lavish Bootstrap, but uh, report developers don't know about it. What I can do is just copy that image in there and go Lavish, and what it did was it took my picture and gave me all the hex that it found in that picture. And so what I can do is just go back to my report and I can say, okay, well, for the customer list, let's make that header a little bit smaller. And now I'm just gonna grab on my toolbox, I'm just gonna grab an image, drag that over, and then what image do I want? I want that piano one that, that you guys, you know, because Co-op Financial Services kind of let me down on a pretty low um, So, Okay, so let's, let's go to our properties here. Let's just change that sizing a little bit to, um, we'll do auto size and we'll, uh, let's actually do fit. Okay, and then piano's kind of hammering me a little bit, but let's, um, let's put that up here a little bit, okay. And then let's take the grid, and I'm just going to kind of do this real quick because we want to get through all 20. But what I can do is I can go back to Lavish, and I can pick like this brown out of it, and just copy it, go back to my report, and we'll just change this header right here. Background color, just drop that. See, most people when they do background color, they like use the color picker. Right? I see the same 20 colors in every single report, and most of them are pretty ugly. Right, but I can like, okay, I want that, and then this customer list, um, that background, we'll just pick something else real quick. We'll pick like the, we'll pick maybe this tan right here. And we'll make that the background color. Okay, and then like, you know, I didn't spend very long on this, did I? How long did I spend? Hardly any time at all. Let's widen this out. And now, doesn't that look a lot better than the first customer list that you saw? Five minutes, right? Three minutes on report formatting. So more of a file to find an image if you need a stock image. And then lavish bootstrap if you want to dissect that image and get the hex out of it and have everything match. Okay, new tip. Wake up. New tip. Okay. Tip number three. Is Grant in the room? Grant? Let me down. What do you go to Steve's session? Okay. So Grant taught me this. Uh, he taught me this five years ago, and I use it all the time. So, to totally new topic. We're not doing reporting. We're doing performance analysis. So, imagine somebody comes to you and says, our SQL server is slow between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. every single day. And you say, well, what are you doing between 3 and 5 p.m.? Well, you don't know. A lot. Who knows? So, my question is, how do you find out what is causing the slowness between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. every day? Now, you guys know these tools before because you use them all the time. I'm going to use them right now. So the first tool is called a performance monitor. Who, who, raise your hand if you've ever used performance monitor. 
Lots. Okay, what does it do? Monitors what kind of performance? Thank you, guys. Monitors performance. Right? Okay, so what, what kind of performance does it monitor? What specifically? Thank you. Who said that? Raise your hand. Hardware. It monitors hardware performance. Specifically, memory processor, um, uh, network, I.O., right? And disk I.O., those big things, right? But then there's all kinds of SQL counters in there, all kinds of crap, right? Okay, so I've got a quick um, data collector set, and I'm just going to run it. That's it. And then I'm going to go to Profiler. What does Profiler do? That's another tool. What's that tool do? Who uses Profiler? Not as many as should. Maybe you're using extended events, which Microsoft would prefer you to use. Okay, so what does Profiler do? Somebody tell me that. It gives a trace. What's a trace? Give, be, be a little more explicit. Thank you. A play-by-play -play of every event on the SQL Server. Every select, every insert, every update. So I have just some kind of like cheesy little query that I'm going to run. Run this query. Run this query. Run this query. Okay, I'm just creating a stupid load, right? Okay, I'm going to go back to my trace, and I'm going to stop it. And then I'm going to go back to my data collector set, and I'm going to stop it. And then there's kind of a bug in Profiler where I have to like close out of it, and then I have to go back in, trace file, and then open up. Was it trace two? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then once I go, get out of it and go back into it, I have this little thing down here, import performance data. I click on that. I grab my, you know, 10.9 performance data right here, the one at 3.13. And look at this. I set it track processor, memory, right? I.O., disk I.O., right? All the SQL Server stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I don't want all those counters. I just want like one per processor time. And I'm going to click OK. And I get my performance chart with processor time synced up to the play-by-play -play that was on the server. And if I look at this load and I click right here, it shows me the query that was running when that load started. And I can see, now, now I look down here and I see, like, okay, I'm sorry for the resolution. What I'm seeing is this, right? That query now begins that detective work to figure out who submitted that. Like, that's causing my issue. Where am I going to go from here? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. If you haven't seen it before? Right. Many of you probably have, because we've had the feature for a long time, but still, kind of cool. Thanks, Grant. All right. Oh, here's a life hack, totally off topic, but if you're doing a presentation, take the average age of your audience, <laughs> and, that, and divide by two, that's the minimum font you can use. <laughs> So, I was at I was at a client the other day, and they said, "Why is our SQL Server slow, Ike?" And you know, they you know, I'm not like a super high bill rate consultant. You know, I mean, I don't work for Deloitte. I work for myself, so it's a re but it's not free. And so they pay me, right? They say, "Hey, Ike, there's a problem," and I I look in their database and I see nothing but heaps. No clustered indexing. Okay, so what's a heap? Wait, wait, say that again? Tables with, no, yeah, you can have non clustered indexes over a heap though, but specifically, what's a heap? So anybody describe, come on, a room full of DBAs. Somebody tell me what a heap is before I fire all of you. <laughs> right, no organization of the data, right? Imagine a trash heap, imagine this heap. Right? So heaps are good for one thing, very fast for one thing. What's that? Right. Inserts, yeah. Very bad for everything else, right? Which, considering that reads outnumber writes on even hot, heavy OLTP databases by about five to one, heaps are 99% of the time a bad idea. So anyway, I go into this client, I see nothing but heaps, right? And I basically run, I don't basically, I exactly run this query right here. And I just put that on any database, right? Like here, new query, check, check all the heaps. Pretty easy, right? It's just select star from sys tables where the type description is a heap. And I get these tables back that are heaps. Now, you might say, well, I, well come on, we're DBAs. Why would we need this tip, right? And I'm telling you that 600 tables in your databases, how many do you think are heaps? 
Do you, did you create all of them? It's probably worth checking. Now what happened with that client is all I did was cluster on their primary key, right? DBA 101, like a CS grad could do it, right? All I did, 300 tables, cluster on the primary key, it was like turning on a switch. It was like, whoa, SQL's fast. I'm like, yeah, SQL can be fast when, you know, we do just basic stuff, but. Um, so anyway, that's tip. What tip was that? Five already. How are we doing on time? We're doing pretty well. We might get through all 20. Okay. Tip number six is the fast one, the proper way to run SSIS packages. Now, if I go back to my SSIS package, you remember that precedent constraint one that, that I did earlier, right? This SSIS for the colorblind? Okay. I know of three ways to execute an SSIS package. I can, I can come up here to the VCR play button up on my toolbar. You know what's really funny is I was teaching a bunch of high school kids, um, and I said VCR play button, and they all looked at each other. Like, <laughs> they're like, you mean, you mean the YouTube play button? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, the YouTube play button. <laughs> so we could do that, right? Or we can go up here to like the debug, right? Start debugging, right? Okay, you're with me? Okay, there's a problem with this, and that is I've got, and I, like again, I apologize for the resolution. Okay, so just drag this over so you guys, can you guys still see that right here? I've got three packages right here, right? Okay, so my question is when I hit the YouTube play button, <laughs> which of those three packages am I gonna run? Not all of them, no. What's the same again? Somebody said it. There, there's two options, and I heard both of them from you. The first one is your set as startup package, and the second one is it depends on how you configure Visual Studio. Well, I'm just going to do the basic one. So, so when you right-click on a package, let's say I right-click on package one, set as startup object. Boom. Now, I'm not in package one right now, right? And what's the, the problem with hitting that play button is the package you're in might not be the package you execute. And the, the second problem with this is, the first step for like every single SSI, not every single, you know, like three quarters, maybe, you know, four fifths of every SSI package I've ever seen has what as a first step? Right, that, right? So by the time you figure out you're executing the wrong package, you've already cleared the tables. And most SSIS package sits take like, what, 15 minutes, 30 minutes to run? You're in for the long wait, right? Now you go to lunch, I guess, and then wait for that to finish and then execute the right one, right? So the right way to execute an SSIS package is to right click on the package and execute package. That one controls every package that you execute. If you get in the habit of that and ignore those up there, you'll never make a mistake. You'll always execute the one you expect to execute. That's what we want to do, right? Okay. Good. C6 all the way, all right. Tip number seven is a SQL Server 2012 tip. Isnol, no reason for Isnol anymore. We're done with Isnol. Is that blasphemy? Did, did I just say something bad? I don't know. I'm surprised nobody is, uh, you know, contending with me, but. Okay, well, here, look. Select star from customers, right? Oh, maybe I should go to the right database. Oh, sales.customers. Stupid schemas get me every time. Okay. So you see this data, right? Company name, contact name, contact title. Everybody with me? Okay. So I think, okay, well, my boss wants to report with a line one. So what I do is I say, give me company, give me contact name plus the contact title plus comma, company name. Is this, this is as, you know, line one, right? Is this kind of common here, you guys? Yeah. You guys have written this code before, right? And I execute, and I think, oh, hey, it worked, perfect. And then I get down here, and I see line 15. What happened there? One of the three fields, what? There's null in one of the three fields. Right, you can can't name null when you get null, right? So what am I doing now? Because I don't know what three fields. Am I going to go through every record to figure out which one's null? No, I'm just going to go to all of them, aren't I? I'm just going to start there. And this is so boring watching me type. It's so boring. We write the same code all the time. And, 
And then we're like, oh man, if, if line one is like 15 concatenated fields, and I know you guys do this because I see your code, um, <laughs> you know, I execute, and now I come back, okay, hey, line 15, it, it worked. Sean Richardson, customer, whatever, that worked, right? That's what you do, is no, no reason to do that anymore. It's ugly code, four lines right there, right? Instead, you can do concat. So contact name. And then the space, and then contact title. And then the dash, or comma, I don't know what I used. And then company name, right? Okay. From sales.customers. Run that, let's take a look at line 15, and we're good, okay. So what you're seeing is concat will just take any number of strings that you throw at it, and if it finds a null, it returns an empty string. And if the entire thing is null, it returns an empty string. No more nulls coming out of strings. So anyway, if you're not upgrading to 2012, that should be enough of a reason. <laughs> okay, so. New, new tip, wake up, new tip. Okay, so tip number eight, how to search schema. Okay, so let's back up for a second. Your boss comes to you and says, Ike, uh, cust ID is showing on this screen and we don't want it there anymore. So just take cust ID out. Okay, whoa, cust ID is, in fact, we don't even use that cust ID. We want to change the data type. Can we change the data type of cust ID? It's like, I want to shoot myself. Okay, so um, yeah, we can change it. Sure, that's what I say. I don't, I don't, I don't say what I'm thinking. So, um, <laughs> so what I do is um, I just hit F7. And F7 comes up with, a lot of people don't know this. This is a window, Object Explorer Details, and it's just built into SQL Server Management Studio, except I need to be connected to a server. So why don't I just real quick connect to localhost. And then let's go to like the T-SQL database. All right. And this object explorer details, I can just type in customers. Oh, there's a table, customers, and I can just click on that. And if I right click on it, and I click synchronize, and then there, it brings me to the definition. You know, and I can do all the stuff that I want to do, like right click and go to design. Kind of cool, isn't it? Did you know guys know that was there? You can could, you could even use wildcards, right? Like percent, cus percent. And now I can see every object that has a name custom somewhere. Just like a T-SQL command, right? That's not bad, right? I don't use it though. So what I use is I use this guy here, SQL search. Okay. And, and I click on SQL search, and the reason why I do SQL search is because if I click like cust ID, it gives me every cust, and then it shows me the definition and like in a store procedure or a view, it gives me the definition and, and highlights what I've typed in for me automatically. And you're like, I, you don't work for Redgate. Why are you, talk, why are you hawking SQL search? I and mean, what are you, a show? Okay, so let's do Redgate SQL search. The reason why I'm telling you about that is because it's completely free. See? It's completely free. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can download that. You can use that. That's way better. You know what? You've got like 300 tables, 500 sort of procedures. I know your job. You know, your job's tough. And if somebody came to you and said, where's that field? It takes you, like, you've got a bug, fix it. It takes you like 30 minutes to find the schema and two minutes to solve the problem, right? So use these tools, especially when they're completely free. And um, you'll save time on that step. Five minute bugs will take five minutes to fix, not 30 <coughs> minutes to fix. So I gave this talk. You guys know Hugo Cornelius, MVP? Yeah, go ahead. One thing to point out, the uh, search uh, compared to the object uh, details is that SQL search looks to cross all the databases. Now, the, uh, the object details that you showed in the Studio is just one database. Oh, yeah, thanks. Now, there is one actually deficiency in SQL search. It doesn't look through jobs. Oh, so, right. Well, but we can look through jobs by going through um, sys job steps in MSDB if we want to. Right. Um, so, Cornel anyway, I was giving this to Cornelius, and Cornelius said, hey, just tell him about um, sys.allsql modules. I'm like, oh yeah, I should. So if you want to write your own query, it's just down here. I, the slides are up on my blog, by the way, if you want to download this. You don't need to take pictures of this. I mean, there's no reason to 
do that. Um, and you don't need to like write down the queries. You know, it's all on my blog. Just download it. So um, select from sys.allsql modules where definition like same thing pretty much if you're in a database. Um, and it and the cool thing about that query is it comes back with the entire definition. So if you're used to using a different table like sys messages that cuts off. Um, this, this, this query is much, much better. Hey, you know what? Windowing functions are pretty cool. You, you guys know what windowing functions are? Yeah. I've seen some like trepidation with using windowing functions a little bit. I have. I've noticed that. And um, I don't know why. Let me take you on an evolution real quick. So let's say that your boss says, hey, Ike, I need to know every customer's freight charges, the detail of their freight, and I need to know their total freight and the percent of their freight and that individual freight charge against their total freight. So if their total freight was $225 and they had a $30 freight charge, you know, I want to know that that's roughly, you know, 15% or so of their total freight. You with me so far? Is that an unreasonable request? You guys get, what? <laughs> I want your job. So, no, you guys get you guys get requests like that every single day, don't you? Like that's a pr he's got a problem. He's just trying to solve it. He doesn't have time to go to the BI team because their answer is always two weeks, right? So, so he needs that question answered today, right? Okay. So, if, I want you to remember. Just hang on with me for a second, okay? I want you to stop and think about what it was like to be brand new to T-SQL. It was a challenge. T-SQL is not intuitive, is it? Okay, so what you did was you, you read a documentation and you said, oh, sum freight. Perfect, as total freight. That's what I want to do. And you executed that and said, it said, what? I've never had this error before, have you guys? Um, <laughs> column cust ID is invalid in the slug list because it's not contained in either an aggregate function or a group by clause. And I think, oh, well, I can solve that. So I say group by. Cust ID, and I execute that, and it says, column freight. No, I got freight in it. I, I have freight in an aggregate. Uh, okay, well, let me just try taking that out. So I take that out. Hey, that's kind of what I wanted, right? There's the cust ID, there's the total freight, just like I wanted. Is that good so far? And then I think to myself, oh, perfect. I'm just going to put freight back in. <laughs> uh -oh. That didn't work, and so I'm just going to put freight down here in the group by clause, and I get something totally worthless, don't I? <laughs> Cust ID, freight, total freight, the exact same thing, right? And so I study and I read, and a week later I might come up with either a subquery or a windowing function where I say something like, bless you, um, total freight by customer, right? And I say, I take this query in here so you guys don't have to watch me type because that's boring. And I drop it down in here, and then I take freight out, and then I take this exact same query that I had before, and I drop it here, and I put freight back in. And you're thinking, what the heck are you doing? This makes no sense. And I think, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to O, join, total freight by customer, T, on o.custid equals t.custid. Okay. And then I'm going to just o dot this guy right here. And o dot this guy. And apparently I, I misspelled this. Total freight by customer. I thought I did that right. Right? No end? Uh, did I miss the as? Thank you. I appreciate the syntax check, especially when I'm typing on the fly. All right. So, oh, and I need ambiguous, right? Man, T-SQL's hard even when you've been coding it for 17 years. Okay, so, and now, that looks good, doesn't it? Right? Cust ID, freight, total freight, everything good so far? Okay. So, so now we've got the CTE going, except, and now we want to, like, do a little bit of um, percentages here. And so what we do with the percentages is we say, remember, remember the boss's order, right? He, he wanted the percent, right? As percent freight. And by the way, before you judge me too harshly, let's see you guys write TC1. Okay, so, so look, cust ID, freight, total freight, percentage of freight, 11.11. .11. Did I satisfy what the boss wanted? 
I did. So you're thinking, well, Ike, you started by saying windowing functions. Why aren't we doing windowing functions, right? Because I want you to remember what I tried to do. This is, this is the power of SQL Server 2012. Remember, I solved it in line 7 to 20, like 13 lines. But if I just used windowing functions and the over by clause and just did over partition by cust ID, I get, the, I get the same good data. And I can even do that same like thing I, I told you about where I said like freight divided by some freight, you know, times a hundred. Right? And I get the same like cost ID one, one dollar twenty one cents is 0.53% of the 225, right? That's good data. That's what you're expecting to see, isn't it? So now I showed you the two ways to do the same thing. One, with a 13-line CTE, and the second, you know, with a five-line windowing function. And, and, and the cool thing about the windowing function is, is I can also do this, right? I can say, you know what, this sum doesn't have an order. So we'll just do over blank as total freight. One more line. Um, let's do the, hey, where were we going? Syntax check on that one. Okay, so, um, man, unreliable. Okay, so, and now I've got like the total freight, $64,918, okay. So what, uh, what windowing functions allow you to do is control the rows in your result set that the aggregate operates over. That's, in a nutshell, what a windowing function lets you do. And I'll take it a step back, and I'll tell you a windowing function lets SQL behave the way you thought it should when you first learned it without all the subquery complexity. And they're worth learning, and you should learn. I think you should learn. Okay. Is okay. there a big performance difference? Well, I mean, this is a tips and tricks, not like a performance thing. And, and I can show you, like, the <laughs> windowing function does confuse the optimizer sometimes. But uh, here's what I do. Um, I don't believe in premature optimization. I, you know, you learn that when you write a lot of code. Um, what I do is solve today's problems today at the last responsible moment. Um, I, except they don't tell my teenage son that. But, <laughs> so so I, I write for clarity first, performance second. All right. Um, oh, brand new with um, SSDT search for options. Okay, so, so remember how you saw me like, where's the line numbers? And I had to like muck around in the tools options table. So this is SQL Server data tools we know and love. We have to write reports and all that stuff. And if I just want to know where line numbers are, I just... I've got a spotlight search, and it just takes me, it drops me right where line numbers are. So that spotlight search, that it, it, it's like a Windows 8 feature. Really? I was expecting a Mac guy to say, whoa, 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 back up, Mike. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, Mac has had that for 10 years, Windows 8 has had it for like a year, and now Visual Studio has it, so. I'm a Mac guy, so I'm not gonna. How am I doing on time? Eh. Um, PowerShell. This tip is on straight up PowerShell. And let me just see, I, I deleted a bunch of files stupidly today, and so I'm not sure, do I have, um, I do, look. I've got, do I have a PowerShell thing? Let's see. Oh, that's Dropbox, let's go to desktop. Um, let's see. Where is it? Um, do you guys see a PL1 script right in front of me? Because see, this is what I get for like trying to clean up my desktop right before. And I don't see it. So um, real quick, let's just see if I can find it real quick. Um, you spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't even have to skip the PowerShell one. It's like one of my favorite ones. This is what happens when I like, try to be clean for you guys. Oh wait, let's see. So, um, let's see. Oh, you got it, where is it? Perfect. I love you guys, you guys are like the greatest. All right, so read event, okay. There it is, okay. So. Thanks you. Thank you for that, by the way. Um, 
you know, you really only have two choices here. You have choice number one, you can either get very good at doing boring, repetitive tasks, or choice number two, you can get really good at scripting. So, what do you think goes better in an interview? Like, you're sitting in an interview and they're like, what do you, how do you do deployment? And you say, oh, deployment, I am a repetitive task machine. <laughs> There is nobody better at repetitive, boring tasks than me. Right? Or do you say, no, 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 no. If, if you make me do something every week, I'm going to script that thing. Like, I don't ever want to do Now, the problem with scripting is, like, you're going to make mistakes. And that's when people give up scripting. Because they're like, I can't script this thing. I made mistakes. Forget it. I'm going back to manual. But the reality is, and I got this from Grant today. I heard Grant say this today, and it just imprinted on my brain. I'm never going to forget. He said... The great thing about scripting is when you make a mistake, you can solve it forever. I'm like, oh, that's great. I'm going to use that today. So, um, and I believe that. I believe that we could be better at scripting. And in this case, I'm talking about PowerShell scripting. So I think PowerShell does just about everything you want it to do. And, and thanks to my helpful audience member who found my read of it, I just want to show you the script real quick. Well, I'm loading up an IDE. There's nothing quick about that. Okay. So, so just let me show you this real quick, you guys. This syntax, look, get the event log. I want the application event log. And I want it where the source in the application event log has SQL somewhere in the title. And please tell me if the entry type equals an error and if it took place in the last, you know, four days or so, right? That's it and then format it for me. That's all. This is just my pressing a key to continue. But up there, that's the gist of it. If, if I asked you, go check the event log for SQL Server errors, you would probably do something just like that's written, right? You would think like the way that's written. It's pretty intuitive. So if I just run this with PowerShell, and um, yeah, go, uh, you always have, by the way, you always have to deal with like permissions in PowerShell. There's a one line of code gets rid of this prompt. I should have just done it. Um, come on. I don't know why that's taking so long. I never took that one before. Let's try that again. Uh, run the PowerShell. Come on. I don't know if I'm running a lot of memory. Seriously, I do this demo all the time and it's like super fast. But I'll talk, and we'll see if it comes up. Um, what this does is it searches through my event log, and it shows me every error that has to do with SQL. And apparently, I don't have any in the last 96 hours. So maybe that's why uh, I usually have some errors, like SSRS errors all the time. Um, OK. So it lists it out just like you know, a strict error list. And the cool thing about that line of code that I showed you is if I wanted to query every SQL server I'm responsible for, I would add two lines of code. If I wanted to dump every error message for every SQL server I was responsible for into a table, two more lines of code. Five minutes after that, I've got a report on it, and I'm emailing that report to myself. So like, think about it. How often are you guys checking an event log to see if there's any SQL errors? Like once a week, probably? Every other week? I mean, you don't have to do that. You could be emailing these things with, to yourself in about 30 minutes of work if you knew PowerShell. So I think PowerShell is worth doing. I just spent a week with it, uh, coding on deployment over um, all, you know, availability groups, always on availability groups, and the SOC clustering. Tip number 12. OK, wake up. Uh, this is TempDB configuration. So TempDB, what's TempDB used for? Say that again? Temporary objects. Temporary objects, like temporary tables and variables. That's one thing. Yeah, what else is it used for? Sorting. Sorting, sorting. yep, that's another thing. What else? Triggers. All those virtual tables and triggers, right? Online index operations. Online index operations. And the, like, the hugest thing it's used for, like it just hammers temp temp TV. Thank you. Snapshot isolation. Okay. So if you're doing any of those things that I've listed, and probably most of you are doing some of those things that I've listed, right? 
then you're hammering TempDB. And TempDB can become the choke point for performance for your entire database. And so the easy way to get out of this is just give TempDB more files. And that way SQL will um, use more files. And the current line of thinking is one file for every four logical cores. So you have eight, two files. Uh, people sometimes say a minimum of four files. So start with four files right off the bat if you have four cores. Don't do it if you have two cores. But if you have four cores, start with four files. And then if you have 16, you're still good. You can stay with four files, right? But you get above that 32 cores, and then you might want to be you know, thinking about uh, eight, eight files, right? And if that's not good enough, then go down to two files to core, maybe even one-to-one, -one, but that's very rare that you need to go one-to-one. -one. Now, when you have multiple TempDB files, you're going to want to make sure that either trace flag 1117 is on, or that you turn off auto grow for all of the files in TempDB, because we want TempDB files to grow at the same length. The si that way the load spreads evenly. So we want, the, we want the same size for every file in TempDB. Should we use a different drive for every TempDB file? Um, should you use a different drive? Um, that is not agreed on. So I think so, but I've seen it where they said, no, 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 we put it on one drive on our SAN and let the SAN take care of it. We are, we're not worried about it. Okay, so Printify. Now, I do a lot of consulting, right? And in my consulting, people, they never come to me like, I think everything's working so great. Come on. You know, usually like there's a problem, right? And, and, uh, and so they say, this query doesn't do what we think it should do, you know? And, and what I learned in consulting is that I was spending like a lot of my time formatting code and only like an hour to fix it, right? But, it would take like an hour just to get it formatted, like double the time. And I really felt like I wasn't adding value to my customers if I spent all my time formatting code. So here's my big question. Is that code in front of you, is this well formatted to you? And let me, let me just go down where, you know, we've got joins, you know. Like this is, looks decently formatted. Right, okay. So I'm just gonna copy that and I'm gonna go back to Chrome and I'm gonna go to SQL, SQL Server Central Pretty Fire. Pretty Fire. That's my girlfriend up here. Did you go through the Pretty Fire? He must have. Okay. Oh. So, okay. So, um, the Pretty Fire. Okay. I gotta plug in. I guess I picked my plug out. There we go. Okay. So, I'm gonna paste there, and then I'm just gonna preserve indenting and Prettify. Okay, and wait a minute. That is a lot different than how that code looked before. Those weren't joining a bunch of independent subqueries. They were joining off of subqueries. Does that give a lot different result than what you expected? And this bug likely caused by nothing more than a formatting problem. Extra parentheses if they subquery off of subqueries, right? So three seconds in the printifier, and immediately I see what the bug is compared to what they were expecting, right? Now the cool thing about the printifier, in my opinion, is that you have source HTML. Because I blog a lot, and if you don't, if you just copy and paste your SQL command, you don't get cool coloring like blue and pink and you know all that cool stuff. So see the rendered HTML, that's pretty, isn't it? So anyway, a couple seconds in the printer fire could save you an awful lot of time. Okay. Um, execute scripts over multiple servers. Super easy, right out of the box. A lot of you guys use a Redgate product for that, but you can just see this thing. You guys know Object Explorer, right? Well, in registered servers, if I expand my local server group, actually, let me delete that one. That's my cloud one. Okay. I can just right-click on the local server group new query, and then select star from sys.databases and execute, and I get a new column. And, oh, you can't see it, excuse me. Server name. And so that query executed against every server in that server group that you saw. So if you have an update script 
and you have 15 servers all with the same databases and you need to check that, you know, am I on the right database and now execute this script, you can do schema deployment across every server you're responsible for. Or if you just need, like this, how many of you have been asked, I want a list of every database on every server? And that is hard unless, you're, unless you have this tool, right? This one line of code, right, on registered servers, and then I can see the unique server names, you know, in the results. Kind of neat, isn't it? Did you guys know that? Yep. You did. Good, good work. Okay. okay. Tip number 15, life is so easy with the dates table. So let me come back. Okay, this is my dates table right here. And, and uh, okay, boss comes to you, and the boss says, I want to know our, we run promotions on the first Monday of every month. And I want to know if our first Monday sales are different than every other day of the month. So I just want to know our sales totals for the first Monday of every month. Is that, is that, what about that guy in the back? Is that a reasonable request? <laughs> no, okay, right. See, I think it is. I think that's a common request that you guys get a lot. Like, and, and the problem with T-SQL, see this, that query is really easy to do in MDX, but, in DAX, but in T-SQL it's not easy to do, right? What I'm doing here is, I've got a recursive CTE where I'm calling myself to find the first Monday in January, and then I just basically count 12 times and get the first Monday of every month. And I'm doing it through like embedded date add functions and date diff functions um, and date part functions to give me the first Monday. And if I run this, you can see January 1st, 2010, January 4th, February 1st, March 1st, April 5th, May 3rd, that, these like, you know, 16, 15 lines of code gives me that. But if I have a dates table, I think you should all have dates tables. That's the short answer, but if I have a dates table, I just want to show it to you in a data warehouse. So here's dim date, and let's just go to design view. And you'll see like date key, um, you'll see like day number of week, as a matter of fact, you know what I should do is just query the dates table for you so you can see the actual values. Can you slide it over a little bit so we can see the... Um, yeah, I can. Yeah, hang on one second. So let me just... Um, dim date. I'm in a data warehouse. No plural. I'm in a data warehouse. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's the date, right? The day number of week for January 1st, 2005 is 7, which was a Saturday. And then, remember we're going January 1st, 2005. The day number of the month is the first. The day number of the year is the first. It's the first week. It's January. January is the first month of the year, over to the right. And then, you know, that took place in the first calendar semester. The third fiscal quarter, so actually the first calendar quarter of 2005, the first calendar semester, the third fiscal quarter of fiscal year 2005, and the second fiscal semester. So all I'm doing in the dates table is just breaking apart every date of the year. Just piecing it apart so that I don't have to use date part anymore. I don't have to you know, do all the complex math to get the first Monday of the month. And now, what happens if I want it the first Monday of the month? I write T-SQL that is easily understood. So this is, you know, group by the English month name. Give me the minimum date where the name of the week is Monday and the calendar year is 2002. You can read that, can't you? Is that readable? If you have a dates table, that's readable, and when you execute it, you get... Um, okay, you want that scooted over. I'm sorry for the projector. But, okay, January... January 4th, February, February 1st, March 1st, April 5th, May 3rd. Same data. Same data that we got from the CTE earlier. But is that maintainable? Like, you write this query, this highlighted query right here, you write this query and six months later are asked to change it. Do you have any hope of, like, knowing what you did? Right? No, you don't even know why you did not this stuff you did, right? But, but you come down here, and that's readable. You can maintain that, right? 
That's, that's the power of the dates table. I'm sorry for preaching, you know. This looks like a pulpit to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, try cast. So let's avoid some terrible casting errors. Try cast, okay. So, so I'm just gonna really quick um, go to Timothy B. And I'm gonna create table one. Okay, and I'm just gonna insert some records in here in table one. And then I'm gonna do like try cast call one as int. This, this is a table, we do these all the time, right? And we get this error, failed when converting the var char value Ike to data type int. And you think, oh great, tell me what row that was. Oh, so that message never tells me what record to go look at, right? So that's like a nightmare. You hate this, don't you? Like you get this error all the time and you hate it. When really you just want some data out of it, you're not really concerned. So what you do is you do a try cast and set, SQL Server 2012, and the results you get are when it can't cast, you get nulls. So at least that tells you the record where you're having the casting problem. So you can go in and fix it. Right. So yeah, try cast. That's useful, huh? Yeah, small little fix, and they solve like a major problem for all of us. Last tip. I only have a few minutes, so last tip. So we got through 17, not bad. Okay, never reinvent the wheel. Um, have you guys seen SQL Sharp? It's written by somebody, I don't know who, I've never met the guy, but man, I love him. So, let's, let's try that again, SQL Sharp. This guy, I know a little bit about this guy. <laughs> I think he wanted to be a stay-at-home dad, but he loved SQL, like the best of both worlds. So he just wrote um, this. Uh, he just wrote this thing, and like we can open up the documentation and uh, you know just look at like what this thing does. These are CLR functions. He wrote these things in C sharp and a DLL that you just like load up in a SQL Server, and and he just thought SQL needed some more functions. So regex, how many of you said, oh, I wish SQL had regex? So, so all the regex functions he wrote for you. Bunch of string functions that, some of them, SQL has one, but he didn't like how it worked. So he like made it better and then put it in here. And then he, and then, so the free version, like this one, split into fields. He'll take a common delimited lit, uh, you know, array and he'll just break it apart for you and put it into fields for you and make it tabular. How often have you written that code by hand? Like, and now you don't need to write that code because string manipulation is C-sharp way faster than string manipulation in T-SQL. So we write it in T-SQL because it's what we know and we gotta do it fast. But if we just you know, used his thing for $200, if you want the not available and free version or free for all the rest of it. Math, like math is prime number. I've never had to use that, but I think it's cool. Um, and then, like all the network stuff, like pinging out of <coughs> pinging out of SQL, and and all the date stuff. Although date stuff's gotten way better in 2012, but still, it's cool to have all the date stuff and copying files back and forth and um, converting, including HTML to XML. He loves Twitter too. Anything you, you never need to use the Twitter client. You just stay with SQL and get all your latest updates. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> So this is his date format here, and just a couple lines of code, and excuse me, that was off the T-SQL database. A couple lines of code, and you're formatting dates any way you want, which has traditionally been kind of a struggle on SQL Server. So no reason to write that yourself. Just, just buy it, pay this guy, stay at home dad. You're supporting his kid, I guess. He's a really cool guy, and I wish I knew his name, Solomon something. Um, but I love his tools, and I'm grateful that he put all the time in. They're great. I've used them in many things. So anyway, that's it, guys. We got through 17 tips in an hour. Thanks a lot for coming. I'm glad you stayed.